Well, we have a, a time. We're going to look today at a fascinating topic, a fascinating subject, and um, how we how I came about this this message today is based on a couple things that I want to share with you. Um, we always say God is good, and you know that every time you know that becomes a saying. God is good, and we say all the time. And all the time, God is good. Do you know that what we're doing is recognizing an attribute of God that He has? The goodness of God. That His goodness is something that is so incredible. It's just amazing. And the Bible is so awesome in in conveying this truth of God's goodness. Not only do we see that God is good, God is a holy God. God's a righteous God. God's a just God and so forth. These are called the attributes of God. And based on the first, when I brought up the fact that God is good, associated with the goodness of God is his mercy. It's the mercy of God. So I believe that we need to pause and take note of God's mercy, the mercy that he has shown each of us, the mercy that is waiting to be released to somebody in need of the mercy of God, right now hearing this message, whether it be live right now online or here in in the sanctuary or maybe somebody's watching it a year from now, 10 years from now, if the Lord should tarry, but on on the internet. But the mercy of God is something that is so powerfully profound and we must grab it and hang on to it and thank God for it. So we're going to talk about two things. With the mercy of God, uh, well, first the mercy itself, and the Bible reveals this incredible thing about God. It uh, relays that He is the God of mercy. The mercy of God coincides with the fact that God is good. And the mercy of God is so profound that we will never truly understand the total depth of His mercy this side of eternity. The second thing connected with with today's message is a, a simple word, called type, type, T-Y-P-E. And you're going, where are you going with this? Is that a type on a paper or what? You know, well, the Bible also not only reveals the attributes of God, but he also, God has put in his word these pictures of who he is so that we can grasp him from, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And so this is another important feature of the inclu- of this that God included in his word, the, the word type. And what is type? Let me give you a quick definition. It's an actual historical event or person that in some ways symbolizes or anticipates a later occurrence, particularly an Old Testament foreshadowing of a New Testament occurrence. So basically, if you want a, a simple definition of a type, it is this. It's something that happens in the Old Testament that points to the New Testament. That's something that foreshadows or talks about something in the New Testament or being fulfilled. And we're going to talk about one of those things today. And this thing is called the mercy seat. And we're going to see how Jesus is the mercy seat. So we're going, to, we're going to take a little tour through the Old Testament today. And so we're going to combine the mercy of God with his story that he put together and crafted this story all through the Old Testament pointing to the New Testament. Friends, the, you can find Jesus, you can find the Son of God, you can find the second person of the Trinity from Genesis to Revelation. He is there. He is there, and very profound. And so God's Word, a lot of people think that the Word of God is just a bunch of stories, uh, and they're not relevant anymore, and this and that. You know what? It is God's Word, and it is God-breathed by the Holy Spirit. God is the author of it, and it's, it's um, amazing that we have this incredible book that tells us how we can live, tells us how we can live in Christ, tells us how we can have eternal life, how we can have life here on earth and have the abundance of God's presence with us daily. 
All this is in there. Well, today we're going to consider the mercy seat. Join with me as we uh, ask the Holy Spirit to lead this message. Father, we thank you for the gathering together as we come. And, and Lord, we thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We thank you for the revelation of Jesus within this word. And Father, we pray that you would touch this message today with the Holy Spirit. It is your word. And Lord, release it to us. And Lord, may we receive it in Jesus' name. And not only may we receive it, but may we live it and walk it daily. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Well, going uh, on here, we have uh, the, the types. And uh, this is one of them. Many of these types point to Jesus. And let me give you an example here. For example, let's, let's give you the Passover lamb that's, that's spoken about in Exodus chapter 12. The Passover lamb, when there's a description of you are to take a lamb um, three years of age or under, uh, bring that lamb into your family. Uh, you are to make this, this meal in haste. You are not to break the lamb's legs. Things very specific. That actually points to Jesus because as we see that when Jesus died on that cross, not a bone of him was broken, which is actually a miracle because of the crucifixion that he went through and the fact that the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, after um, you know, the crucifixion took place, it was time to uh, speed up the death process for the two soldiers or two uh, criminals that were hanging on the crosses uh, next to Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. They broke their bones. But when it came to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and uh, John, the Baptist, is the one who pronounced that. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the Passover Lamb. Jesus' bones were not broken because he had dismissed his spirit. He had dismissed his spirit. He was the one in control of releasing his spirit. And he went, and, and there he died. But his, not a bone of, of uh, the Lamb was broken. This is a picture of Christ, and we see that throughout Scripture. We see these various pictures. Today, we're going to look at the mercy seat. And so let's take a look at uh, Exodus chapter 17, verse 22. I believe we should start in verse 10. So let's, let's get some context here about what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, and, and this is the instructions uh, for making the Ark uh, given by God. And it says, have them make a chest of acacia wood two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark in the test put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. Verse 17. Make an atonement cover of pure gold. I want to tell you something. The word atonement here is also mercy seat. So make the the mercy seat. He said, make the mercy seat cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one side, end, on one end, and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put it in the ark the testimony which I will give you. There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all the commands for the Israelites. Now I want you to stop and think about this. What the Lord is speaking of here is the, the ark, the ark of the covenant. But there's one thing that stands out above the rest of the ark, and that's the cover. We're going we're gonna to look at three things surrounding this piece of, of history, but it actually is a picture of Jesus. 
So I want to share this with you today on how God fulfilled his promise of sending Messiah, of sending a Savior, of sending his Son to die for us on the cross, to bear our sin, and to bring restoration. So here we go. Let's take a look at it. I want to give you a little definition of mercy through a story. I read this story. I want to share it with you. Uh, There's a story of a mother who once approached Napoleon. So this is a long time ago. She approached Napoleon, and she was seeking a pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense, and he did it twice, and justice demanded his death. But I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy. But your son does not deserve mercy, Napoleon replied. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it, and mercy is all I ask for. Well then, the emperor said, I will have mercy. And he spared the woman's son. Mercy is something that is not deserved. In fact, none of us deserve mercy. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. There's only one whose name is Jesus. And he became, for us, he became sin so that we could be free from sin. He took our sins upon himself to the point that the Father couldn't even look upon Jesus. He turned away because Jesus bore the sin of the world. Past, present, and future. Jesus died once and for all for that sin. So let's look at this portrait of Christ. Let's consider, first of all, the construction of the mercy seat. It says, and you will make a mercy seat of pure gold. So here's the first thing that we see. The mercy seat, first of all, what is the mercy seat when it comes to the Ark of the Covenant? It is simply the cover that goes on the box. It is the top portion of the Ark of the Covenant. And so it was made out of solid gold. Why was it made out of solid gold? Well, Scripture talks about gold, and we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but let's look here first that the mercy seat is the cover, and it was out of the square dimensions, two and a half cubits long, uh, uh, one and a half cubits wide, and one and a half cubits high. This would be two and, a, two and a quarter feet in height and the width of three and three quarters feet in length. So probably about like this and about like that wide, solid gold. That's got to have some heft to it, some weight. And so why gold? Gold is associated with the Lord. Gold is the, the, the metal of God's presence. All right. Now, we, we have other arcs that are mentioned in Scripture. And just give you a review, what the, the one we're familiar with, we uh, learned in, in Sunday school, that was Noah's Ark in Genesis chapter 6. Noah's Ark provided salvation for eight people. Then you get to uh, Moses' Ark. Remember Moses, he, he was floated down the river in that papyrus basket? That's referred to as an ark. And that ark gave salvation for one person, Moses. But through that one uh, person that was spared, his life was spared, God raised up a deliverer and, and got the Israelites out of Egypt. And then we have God's ark, this ark, the, the ark of the covenant. Within it, the law is hidden. This is salvation for all. This is God's ark, and it includes even us, the Gentiles, that we are grafted into God's family. Aren't you thankful for that? That the promises that the Lord made, you know, he told, he to, God told Abraham, you will have many, many children that will outnumber the stars in the heavens above. Can you count those stars? And here God is including us. We're grafted into this family. So the mercy seat, it's constructed using the metal that is associated with deity, with God. Gold is a precious, precious item, even yet today. And we know this, that God paves the streets in heaven with gold. Wouldn't you love to have a gold driveway? You know, <laughs> and that would be, I think it'd be maintenance free. You know, you wouldn't have to fill it. Well, whatever. Well, um, 
The mercy seat is one solid piece of gold, and this is the, the part that's on top. And this is associated with God. Now, what the children of Israel, and especially the high priests, are to consider is God is meeting with his people. There was a process in going into the Holy of Holies. The, the priest didn't just walk right in. There was a process to go in. There's a process of purity, of holiness, of repenting of sin, making sure nothing comes between the, that priest and God. And so there was a, a time of, of renewal, a time of confession, and blood was shed, and blood was placed on that cover. That blood was sprinkled on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, and God accepted the sacrifice. Notice this, that in, in uh, the verses that we read, God specifically said, and I will meet with you there. God's presence actually was over the top of that cover. God's presence. This, the mercy seat is associated with the presence of God, where his presence was there. And, you know, the high priest had to go through this, this uh, very uh, strict process because God is a holy God. Friends, God still is a holy God. God is very holy. He doesn't, he doesn't look uh, lightly upon sin. He takes sin very seriously. That's why he sent Jesus to deal with sin for us. And so God is, God is concerned with holiness. And God is teaching his people that we need to also be concerned with the holiness of God. If you notice the cherubim, we'll talk about them in a moment, but the cherubim are seen as bowing before God. Cherubim are a type of angel, and as I say, we'll look at them in more detail, but their wings are down. They're winged angels. Cherubim and seraphim are, are mentioned in Scripture as winged. Many angels don't even have wings. And um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, Clarence, the angel, didn't have to earn his wings because uh, some angels don't have them, okay? And they're not earned. Angels are seen in different categories in Scripture. And these angels, cherubim and seraphim, are associated with guarding the presence of God. They're, they're guardian angels for, for the presence of God and associated with the ministry of Israel. Well, as we look here, what does the gold mean? The gold speaks of God's presence. Okay? So the gold is there. And we have the rest of the ark, the, the covering that was, uh, the, the, the mercy seat was put on the rest of the ark. That was made out of acacia wood that had gold covering over it, inlaid gold over it. So the acacia wood is symbolic of humanity. The gold is symbolic of God's presence. Now who took those two things and put them together when he came? Jesus. Remember what the angel said? He said the virgin will, the virgin will be with child and she will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, God's presence in Christ Jesus. Jesus is God, and he's also man. And he came. He's, he came as like that acacia wood, but he's covered in gold because of who he is. He left the streets of heaven for, for this place, earth. When he was born, he was, he was born and then placed in a stable. You know, the king of kings and the Lord of lords was placed in a stable. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's what Philippians 2 tells us. So we have here the construction of the mercy seat actually points to Jesus. Let's look at this even more so. The next thing that we see is the configuration of the mercy seat. These are in verses 18 to 21. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of beaten work shall uh, you make them. In the two ends on the mercy seat, uh, you will make one cherub on the one end and the other on the other end, and they will have wings that will go out and they will bow down towards the center. So what do we have here? Well, the cherubim, they're a specific type of angel. We have them popping up in Scripture a few times. 
First time we see them is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. This is after the fall. This is after Adam and Eve disobeyed God and uh, they became aware of their sin. Sin came in and there it took root. Well, they were driven from the Garden of Eden. God drew, drove them out. And in Genesis 3.24, it says, After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree of life. These angels are associated as guardians. They're sentinels. And notice this picture. They have a flaming sword. And they're guarding. Because once Adam and Eve were driven out, it, to drive means to force out. And it was their sin that God had to deal with, so he had to drive them out. But do you know that before they were driven out, what did God do? He provided them with garments, a garment of, of skin. Well, how did that happen? Some animal had to give its life to cover up Adam and Eve. The first time blood was shed in the garden was done not by man, but by God himself. He is the one that established the blood sacrifice. He is the one that established without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Another word for mercy seat is atonement. Have you heard of Yom Kippur? That is, uh, a, that is the day of atonement where our sins are atoned for and so forth. Once again, we'll see that in a few minutes. Well, as we go on here, cherubim were guarding uh, the, the garden there. The next we, thing we see is in Psalm chapter 80, verse 1. The Lord is, is enthroned between two cherubim. And it says in Psalm 81, Hear us, O Lord, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between cherubim. So we have the, the cherubim mentioned there. Psalm 99.1 says, The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the whole earth shake. His presence is so mighty. His presence is so awesome. In the book of Isaiah, we have Isaiah chapter 6. Those are, there are some seraphim, seraphs. That's another type of angel that's associated with the presence of God. And they're worshiping God and they're calling out together, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it says in there, in Isaiah chapter 6, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shake. Friends, I believe that we are headed to some incredible things that we will experience in glory. We're going we're gonna to experience that worship, the worship of the angels. We will join with the angels in the worship of our God. The doorposts and the thresholds will shake. Friends, that's incredible. God's presence brings this worship to alive. Well, the cherubim are seen as guarding the way that man is forgiven of sin. And here's what we see. This is what their, their presence uh, with that gold uh, cherubim on one side and the other. They're guarding the way that God deals with our sin. So another thing here. We have the word propitiation. Propitiation is an important word. To propitiate means to win somebody's favor, to appease, or to conciliate something or someone. And so when we have this propitiation, what does that mean? It means an all satisfaction. And so Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his death, his shedding of his blood, was all satisfying for taking care of our sin. You and I are forgiven completely. I want you to hear this, that when you ask God to forgive you, and when you repent from your heart, and you say, God, I'm so sorry I messed up, I want you to know that when you confess your sin by saying, Lord, I am so sorry for that, you know what God does? Does God say to us, well, you need to try better next time. I want you to take a 10-step program then and, and follow this through. No, he says, I forgive you. And it's done because of the all satisfaction of the blood that was shed for us. Friends, there's power in the blood of Jesus. 
There's power in his blood. In his blood, he heals us. In his blood, he washes us clean and makes us as white as snow. His forgiveness is total. This is called propitiation. Paul uses this word, propitiation, a couple times. In Romans 3.25, Paul says, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. You see, Jesus died for us many thousands of years ago, and that covenant is still in place. It will never, ever lose its power. His blood is forever, and it's covered. We are covered. So Paul said this, that propitiation or all satisfaction or atonement. Propitiation is another word for the atoning power of God. All right, through his blood, it's shed from Jesus' blood. Amen? Hebrews 9, 5 is the second reference Paul gives, and it says, and over it, it and let's see, and over it the cherubim of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we can now speak particularly. In other words, Paul talked about the mercy seat being the propitiation, being the all satisfaction. You see, these people in the Old Testament, they went through this this, um, this, this ritual that God set up that pointed to Jesus. It pointed to Him. And our Messianic Jewish friends who, who grew up in this, this, this area of knowing what, what the Passover means and so forth, when they realize that it, it's Jesus, I mean, they grasp it. And I've talked to uh, dear Messianic friends of mine who... Tell me about this is, this is what I saw when I met Messiah. They get it more than I think we can understand. You know what I'm saying? As Gentiles, we are somewhat missing some things associated with the power of the Passover pointing to Jesus. In fact, Paul calls him Jesus, our Passover lamb. He's called the Passover lamb. The lamb is a type of Jesus, a type of Christ. The Apostle John also uses the word of propitiation. He uses it to describe the sacrifice of Jesus as he became the all satisfaction for paying the penalty of our sins with his blood. The word John uses is somewhat different, but it's rooted with the same root that Paul uses. And here's what John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of of the whole world. In other words, friends, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to God. It's only through Jesus. 1 John chapter 4.10, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, to be that atonement. He's the mercy seat. Friends, we come finally to the third part of our message this morning and I'm just going to switch here we have uh, number three today and that's this one the connection of the mercy seat and us and God here's where it all comes together it says in verse 22 and there I will meet with you and I will commune with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give you in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now, this message to the Israelites in Exodus 25, that's, that is specifically for the children of Israel. But guess what? Because this points to Jesus, Jesus became the mercy seat. And Jesus was placed in a public place and crucified. It was there the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world, was nailed to the cross publicly, and it was there where God's presence and human's presence came and collided. You see, God's presence was there in Christ Jesus. He became the mercy seat. He is the mercy seat. He is the one that took our sins and bore them. You see, a picture of Jesus is pure gold. 
But you wouldn't know it with all the blood that was running down him that day. You wouldn't know it because as, as a, a group of um, theologians and physicians who considered the, the death of Jesus, they wrote a, an article in the Journal of a Medical uh, Association back in the 80s. It was called On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ. And they, they came from a, a physician's point of view and using the anatomy and so forth. And, and they brought this out. And it was their conclusion that Jesus, when he was crucified, he was whipped so much that his flesh became like, to quote them, ribbons of quivering skin. He was whipped, he was beaten, but yet not a bone was broken. He bore that punishment for us. They took gold and they spit on it. They took gold and they, they beat on him. See, the Lamb of God is the mercy seat. And it was there God meets with his people. I want to leave you with this. That at the mercy seat, you're going to find three things. You're going to find, number one, communion and forgiveness going together. Communion means fellowship. A fellowship with God in His presence because of the mercy seat of Christ. It is through Jesus that we enter into the throne room of God. In fact, when you begin your prayer time, you say, Lord, I come to You in the name of Jesus. I come to You under the blood of the Lamb that was shed for me and I come into your presence and I say thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to die for me. You, when you and I recognize the sacrifice that Christ made for us, there's communion there. We get it. We understand. You see, we don't have a religion. We have a relationship. You don't go to church to get to God. You don't go to church. You don't do things for your own glory. You know, well, what, what's church good for then? You know, it says in Scripture, don't forsake the gathering together as some are in the habit of doing, but come together and encourage each other all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, we come to the, the church to gather to worship our Lord. We come to lift His name up. We come to, to cast our burdens on Him. Amen? And, and release them. We come to hear from Him. We come to get refreshed in His presence. What happens when you walk through a stinky room? You start to stink. What happens when you walk through a world that doesn't serve God? You begin to feel like you've been in the world and, and you, you know the world is kind of clinging to you and, and so forth. The Lord says, come out and be separate from them. Because God's looking for holiness today. And it's in Jesus that we find that. We're not holy in ourselves. It's only by His grace and mercy that we have His holiness bestowed upon us. And so, friends, we find communion and forgiveness. A second thing is that we find a satisfying, a satisfied God who is satisfied because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. Remember what Jesus said on the cross? When He bore the sin, He said, It is finished. It's done. It's done. I hope you feel so encouraged today. I hope you feel so charged up because you have been forgiven your sin. God takes our sin and He throws it in the wind and He casts it as far as the east is from the west and He chooses to forget it. He chooses to. So we ought to be the most joyful people on the face of this earth. Amen? The next thing is joy. Joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Joy and the fruit is a byproduct of God's presence. In other words, an apple tree, the byproduct of an apple tree is an apple. The byproduct of an orange is an orange. Pretty good. I learned that in school. You know? And friends, I want to just say this, that when we have joy and we have peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these things are byproducts of God's presence being with us, being in us, the Holy Spirit. 
the fruit of the Spirit. It comes by way of being in God's presence. We end up taking on that characteristic because the more and more that you're in God's presence, the more and more you want His presence. The more desire to be in His presence. So this is what God did. He took His Son, the mercy seat, and He hung Him on a cross for a world to see. And even though we weren't there, we were represented. Our sins were represented. Everything that we ever did, Jesus paid for that day that He died on that cross. I can't fathom that in my, my mind, but that's profound to me that Jesus died for the sins of the world, the sins of the past, the present, and the future. And that's why there's hope in Jesus. That's why the mercy seat is so powerful. Jesus shed His blood to satisfy the Father's, the Father's holiness. And so this is what we have in Hebrews 9, verses 12 and 14. And I close with this. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, in other words, he didn't go into the Holy of Holies like in the tabernacle with the blood of goats and calves. But he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Friends, we have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus is our mercy seat. He provided the atonement that we need so that we may truly live. So what is life? What is life? Life with Christ is real life. Life with Christ is overflowing. Rivers of living water, talking about the Holy Spirit being in us, rivers of living water will flow from you. You'll have the, the Holy Spirit whom we take with us. By the way, you came to church today. You, you know, you came expecting the presence of God. Yes, He is here, amen? But did you know you brought His presence in? God doesn't dwell in buildings. He dwells in bodies. He dwells in us. And we are the body of Christ. And His Spirit, His Holy Spirit is within us. And we've all had an encounter with the mercy seat. Jesus. Isn't God good? This plan that He made goes back before the creation of the world. What a God we serve. God put this together for three reasons, or for three little words. Let me just give them to them to you. This sums up this whole thing. Here's why God did it. This is why God painted Christ this way. Because God said to the world, I love you. I love you. That's, God's good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the mercy seat. We thank you for the portrait that we have in the Old Testament, in Exodus 25. We thank you that Jesus is our mercy seat. He became a man. Even though he's God, he's clothed in gold, but he came, became a human, came in the form of acacia wood. Lord, we thank you for sending your son. If there's somebody here today that they are in desperate need of your mercy, your mercy is available. It is yet available. And it will be until Jesus comes back. It will be. And Lord, the hours are coming. And the hours are going. And Lord, we don't know how much time we have left. But Lord, we come to you today and we plead for your mercy. If there's somebody here who needs Jesus, all they need to do is call upon the name of the Lord and they will be saved. Confess your sins and He will forgive you. Believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and you will be saved. Father, we pray for those folks looking for the reality of your mercy. We pray that, that they will see you in this word today. 
And Lord, we pray that somebody wouldn't just walk away from this word, but they would take it and apply it, that they would have the encounter at the mercy seat. In Jesus' name.